What is a dinosaur? The truth, as always, resists simplicity. Okay, so after the first few videos, you might be sitting here wondering, isn't the term dinosaur just as arbitrary as bird? Isn't it just a label that humans have invented for a group of animals? And that's true. But we do know that all dinosaurs have a clear statistic definition, unlike birds. It's all the descendants of the most recent common ancestor of Iguanodon and Megalosaurus. But why those two? And those of you who've been watching my last video on cladistics might be wondering, how can we tell if something falls into that group? What are the synapomorphies of dinosauria? Now, dinosaurs are a group of Avimetatarsalians, which is the group of archosaurs that are more closely related to birds than they are to crocodiles. Now, we'll get into more details about that group later, but dinosauria is specifically a group of Avimetatarsalians that consists of the most recent common ancestor of Iguanodon and Megalosaurus and all that ancestor's descendants. But why did we define dinosauria here? Why didn't we do dinosaur forms, which includes many dinosaur-like animals, or even dinosaur morpha, which are all Abimetatarsalians more closely related to dinosaurs than they are to pterosaurs? Why didn't we just include pterosaurs and do Ornithodira? Or why didn't we include all of the bird line archosaurs and just go the whole hog with Abimetatarsalia? Why didn't we just do all of archosaurs, include crocodiles and dinosaurs? Because why not? Why not do archosaur morphs? Then we have plesiosaurs in the game. Why not just do sauropsida and then we just have all reptiles or dinosaurs? We draw the line anywhere. What's the difference between all of these things? Oh my god, stop the madness! Phew. Okay, dinosaur classification has been a long journey. Admittedly, every step along the way has been arbitrary, but that's kind of how classification works. It's a human way of defining the world. Dinosaur has never equaled reptile. Dinosaurs have always been a group of reptiles. You know, like crocodiles, turtles, lizards, and they're not interchangeable. You wouldn't call a turtle a crocodile, would you? So don't call every reptile a dinosaur. But why not call crocodiles dinosaurs? They are archosaurs and closely related, but dinosaurs were originally defined by a very specific feature. You may have even heard of it. See, with dinosaurs, it's all about how they walk. Walking? Yeah, that thing. Back during the days of Linnaean taxonomy, dinosaurs were, first and foremost, categorized based on the fact that they had legs directly underneath their bodies. This is different than most other reptiles, including all modern non-avian reptiles, which have a sprawling posture. If you would like to compare gait, here is an example of a dinosaur with its legs directly underneath its body, and here is a Pseudosuchian, a crocodile-line archosaur with its legs sprawling, aka out to the sides. But wait, you're saying? That's a trait! This is Linnaean taxonomy! Oh no! Yes. Yes, it is. It is a relic from our days spent in Linnaean darkness, and a lot of things were mistakenly called dinosaurs back in the day because they had an erect gait. And today, in our days of cladistic beauty, we have a lot of things that have erect gaits that aren't put into dinosauria because they aren't descended from the most recent common ancestor of Megalosaurus and Iguanodon. So why Megalosaurus and Iguanodon? They were the first two things that were called dinosaurs. Megalosaurus and Iguanodon were the first two things that we called dinosaurs that were discovered. Pterosaurs are not part of the group that includes just them. And birds are, so hooray, dinosaurs are still around. But what about all those animals that aren't quite dinosaurs, but definitely aren't pterosaurs, but are in bird line archosaurs? These are stem dinosaurs, and they complicate everything. Hey now, dinosaur morphs are pretty cool, but you know, not all of them are dinosaurs. So this thing? Looks like it has an erect gait and looks pretty dinosaur-y. Not a dinosaur. Nope. Just nope. There are lots of weird and cool almost dinosaurs. Lagosuchus, Lagerpetin, and Dromermeron are all dinosaur morphs, Avimetatarsalians that are more closely related to dinosaurs than to pterosaurs. And then Marasuchus, Niasosaurus, Saltipus, Luasuchus, Pseudolagosuchus, Acillosaurus, Eusiophysis, Silosaurus, Sassosaurus, and Diodorus are all dinosaur forms, the group that's descended from the most recent common ancestor of Marasuchus and dinosaurs, and it is a more exclusive clade than dinosaur morpha. And yeah, you might mistake these things for dinosaurs. They had a gait that if you were to see them today, you probably would call erect. They probably had protofeathers like dinosaurs and pterosaurs, but more on that in the future. They were very active little animals, like dinosaurs were. And, you know, they were so very closely related to dinosaurs that they looked just a lot like them. But according to our arbitrary decisions, they weren't. Because they weren't in that most exclusive clade that just consists of the descendants of the most recent common ancestor of the first two dinosaurs discovered even though they looked a lot like early dinosaurs, such as Silosaurus or Marasuchus, both of which look a lot like early dinosaurs. Okay, my cladists, you're asking for synapomorphies now, aren't you? Things that were unique to that first dinosaur. Well, things are about to get really technical. Here is your complete list of dinosauria-only synapomorphies. First off, the temporal musculature that extends anteriorly onto the skull roof, aka muscles in the face that elevate the lower jaw 
to allow it to close were very strong in the original dinosaur. The posterior process of the juggle bifurcates to articulate with the quadrato juggle, aka <laughs> the cheek region of the skull is stronger than in most reptiles, probably to help with synapomorphy 1 and to create a stronger bite force. Next, epipophyses on the cervical vertebrae, aka projections of bone that increase the available attachment area of muscles of the neck, indicating that these muscles were stronger or had a greater range of motion than dinosaurs. Next, an elongate deltopectoral crest, aka a rigid bone on the humerus upper arm bone that anchors the deltoid muscle of the shoulder and the pectoralis muscle of the chest. This would allow for a very powerful range of forelimb motion. Next, what we've all been waiting for, trust me, the open acetabulum in the pelvis. This is the joint surface on the pelvis that holds the femur, aka the thigh bone. In dinosaurs, there is no medial wall. The socket itself is open. This is not found in dinosaur forms, only in early dinosaurs. This allowed for a full 90 degree angle upright posture. You wouldn't be able to tell that just from looking at, say, Marasuchus versus an early dinosaur, but that 90 degree angle between the ball of the femur and then the hip itself is what causes that upright posture and allows for that direct downward angle of the leg. Keep in mind, dinosaurs aren't the only things with open acetabulums. Some other reptiles have them too, such as Ephigema and Poposaurus. These examples of a convergent evolution is why cladistics is important. An open acetabulum is not what defines a dinosaur. Dinosaur is a name given to an evolution evolutionary relationship that we have characterized using a variety of traits, like how we diagnose an illness based on symptoms. The symptoms are not, in fact, the disease. Anyway, back to synacomorphies. Next, the fourth trochanter of the femur was asymmetrical. This is a ridge on the femur present in all archosaurs that allows for powerful movement in the group, and it retracts the leg while walking. It's unsure, though, why asymmetry in this feature was useful for dinosaurs. And then, the articular facet for the fibula occupies less than 30% of the width of the astrolagus, aka these two bones and archosaurs that form the articulation between the lower leg and the foot in the hind limb, aka the ankle, which is what we will talk about more in Abimetaharsalia, but in dinosaurs, the fibula is reduced and the tibia is the dominant bone of the lower leg when it comes to connecting to the ankle, allowing for a more upright posture and faster locomotion. Phew, isn't it just easier to say Megalosaurus and Iguana on rather than list a series of synapomorphies. So what do dinosaur morphs and dinosaurs tell us about dinosaurian evolution? Mainly, that dinosaurs were evolving upright posture, fast locomotion, and a skeleton that was very reinforced by the body's musculature. Dinosaur morphs show many early signs of this evolutionary trend. Compared to pterosaurs, they have more vertebrae, an elongated pubis, larger hind limb muscles, a digitigrade posture, pterosaurs did too, but still, with a reduced fifth and first toes. While pterosaurs do show some of these general features, especially the whole walking on toes thing, this shows the general evolution of dinosaur morphs for speed and agility. So what do all Ave Metatarsalians share? You know, the group including all archosaurs that are more closely related to modern birds than to crocodiles. Well, we'll talk about this next time with a special emphasis on pterosaurs. Just remember, while the exact definition of dinosauria is arbitrary, Megalosaurus plus Agonodon is a clade and an important one that showcases the general idea behind dinosaurs. Fast, feathered, strong, and upright. These are things we still see in modern dinosaurs, aka birds, today. And all modern dinosaurs say to you, thanks for watching.